digestive system, the digestive system is a complex, continuous tube that includes the functions of modified ingestion swallowing, deglutition, digestion, absorption of nutrients and fluids, and elimination of indigestible residues and gases. The glandular portion of the digestive system may be intramural or extramural. Oral gavies, the oral cavity, mouth, lined by a wet stratified squamous epithelium, is subdivided into two spaces the vestibule and the oral cavity proper. The subepithelial connective tissue and the epithelium together are known as the oral mucosa. When epithelium is keratinized or parakeratinized because of friction, the mucosa is referred to as masticatory mucosa, located on the gingiva, hard palate, and dorsal tongue most of the oral cavity has a lining mucosa. The dorsum of the tongue and areas of the soft palate and pharynx possess taste buds, and those regions are referred to as specialized mucosa. The paired major salivary glands produce saliva, which possesses salivary amylase, the antimicrobial agents lactoferrin and lysozyme, and IgA, and maintains a moist environment. During eating, flow of saliva allows macerated food to be formed into bolus that can be swallowed. Each lip, Fig 16.1a, has three surfaces, the hairy external skin aspect, the red vermilion zone, and the wet mucosal, internal, aspect. The tall reedy apparatus of the vermilion zone brings capillaries near the surface imparting a pink color to it. The mucosal aspect is always wet and has a lining mucosa whose richly vascularized connective tissue possesses lip. Angular chylitis, is a painful condition in which the corners of the lips become dry and cracked, it is frequently due to dietary deficiency of vitamin B, zinc deficiency, or iron deficiency anemia. The lesions are most common in elderly individuals who have poorly fitting dentures, and the area becomes infected with pathogens such as Candida albicans. Oral cavity, the lining mucosa of the lips and cheeks may become ulcerated, small areas that are characterized by small, red-rimmed, white, painful spots known as canker sores, or aphthous ulcers. These lesions are usually stress-related and resolve within 7 to 10 days. The pain can be relieved by the application of a local anesthetic ointment. Squamous cell carcinoma, is the most common oral cancer. It is initially painless and appears as a smooth or rough surfaced red or white lesion that may be in the form of a hard lump or an ulcerated depression that bleeds occasionally. In almost half of affected individuals, these carcinomas occur on the lining mucosa of the lip, whereas in the remaining individuals the affected area is the tongue or the floor of the mouth. Frequently, squamous cell carcinoma is caused by smoking, alcohol use, or the use of smokeless tobacco, but individuals who neither drink alcohol nor use tobacco products may have the disease. The treatment is usually a combination of surgery and radiation therapy. Odontogenesis before the bell stage, odontogenesis, or tooth development, begins between the sixth and seventh weeks of development when the ectodermal oral epithelium proliferates to form a horseshoe-shaped dental lamina, one on the maxillary arch and one on the mandibular arch, Fig 16.2. The dental lamina is separated from the neural crest-derived ectomesenchyme by a basement membrane. In ten different regions of each dental lamina, a bud forms, beginning the bud stage of odontogenesis. Each of the 20 buds presages a specific deciduous tooth. The ectomesenchyme at the tip of each bud condenses to form dental papilla. Each bud enlarges by mitotic activity and forms a three-layered enamel organ the cap stage of odontogenesis. The simple squamous epithelium, the outer enamel epithelium, OE, is continuous at the rim-like cervical loop with the concave simple squamous cuboidal inner enamel epithelium, i.e. The stellate-shaped cells of the stellate reticulum are located between the IEE and OEE. The basement membrane completely surrounds the enamel organ whose concavity is filled with the dental papilla, a well-vascularized ectomesenchyme. The enamel organ and dental papilla together are known as the tooth germ. The later stage of the enamel organ alters its morphology to form a template that is incisiform, caniniform, or molariform. This ability of the enamel organ depends on the enamel knot, a cluster of cells located among the cells of the stellate reticulum. 
it is the principal signaling center of tooth formation. The dental papilla manufactures fibroblast growth factor 4, FCF4, and epidermal growth factor, EGF, both necessary for the survival of the enamel knot, which synthesizes FCF4, sonic hedgehog, and various bone morphogenetic proteins that direct the transformation of the enamel organ into a molariform template. When the transformation is complete, the dental papilla ceases to express ECF and FCF4, and the enamel knot undergoes apoptosis. The dental papillae of incisiform and caniniform enamel organs never express FCF4 or ECF, and their enamel knots undergo apoptosis during the cap stage. The absence of the enamel knot results in the formation of a default non-cusp tooth. The dental papilla forms the dentin and the pulp of the tooth. The ectomy zenchyme surrounding the tooth germ forms a thin, dense connective tissue layer, the dental sac, which forms the alveolus, PDL, and cementum of the tooth. Enamel is synthesized by ameloblasts, cells that are differentiated from the IE. The permanent teeth arise from the succedaneous laminae of the 20 tooth buds. The 12 permanent molars arise from the extensions of the two dental laminae that begin to elongate. As the cap grows in size, a fourth layer, the stratum intermedium, appears that is characteristic of the bell stage, stage of histodifferentiation and morphodifferentiation. As development continues, the cells of the IEE at the region farthest from the cervical loop become elongated cells known as premaloblasts as they begin to manufacture enamel matrix, these cells mature into ameloblasts, Fig 16.3. In response to the initial formation of enamel, the layer of dental papilla cells that abut the basal lamina differentiate into preodontoblasts, and when they begin to manufacture dentin matrix, they mature into odontoblasts, see Fig 16.3. The dentino-enamel junction is established, and the appositional stage of tooth development begins. Initially, the dentino enamel junction is just a microscopic region that continues to spread along the concavity of the enamel organ and eventually reaches the cervical loop. While that is taking place, ameloblasts and odontoblasts continue to manufacture enamel and dentin, respectively. Both hard tissues become thicker, and the two cell types are displaced farther and farther from each other. When enamel formation is completed, the cervical loop elongates forming a cylindrical sheet, Hertwig's epithelial root sheath, HERS, composed only of OEE and IEE that encloses, and is surrounded by, ectomesenchymal cells. The enclosed ectomesenchymal cells are continuous with the dental papilla and form radicular pulp and radicular dentin. The older regions of HERS begin to disintegrate, and some ectomesenchymal cells surrounding HERS migrate onto the radicular dentin surface, differentiate into cementoblasts, and manufacture cementum. As hers continues to lengthen, more and more of the root is formed, and finally the last region of the root housing the apical foramen is produced. As the root becomes longer, the tooth is erupting into the oral cavity. The eruptive motion is independent of root elongation even though the two processes occur concurrently. Eruption is affected by the activity of specialized myofibroblasts of the dental SAE that, by tugging on the type I collagen fibers of the dental SAE, future PDL, attached to the cementum, drag the developing tooth into occlusion structures associated with T. The alveolus PDL and gingiva are associated with teeth and assist each tooth in maintaining its proper position in the oral cavity, Fig 16.4. The PDL, composed of a cellular, neurovascular, dense, irregular collagenous connective tissue, occupies the narrow PDL space, width and 0.5 mm in a healthy mouth, between the cementum of the root and the alveolus, see Fig 16.4. The type I collagen fibers of the PDL are arranged in principal fiber groups, which resist and accommodate the forces of mastication. They suspend the tooth in its alveolus via Sharpies fibers embedded in the cementum and in the alveolar bone. The most numerous cells of the PDL are fibroblasts, which not only synthesize the extracellular matrix but also degrade its epithelium reaches the enamel, it makes a sharp bend and attaches, via hemidesmosomes, to the enamel surface as an epithelial band around the entire circumference of the tooth, 
which is known as the junctional epithelium. This thin, wedge-shaped, 1 mm long epithelial collar that is no more than 50 cells wide coronally and less than 7 cells broad apically prevents the abundant population of microorganisms of the oral cavity from invading the sterile connective tissue of the gingiva. The palate, composed of the anterior, immovable hard palate and posterior, movable, muscular soft palate, separates the nasal and oral cavities from each other. On the oral surface, the hard palate is lined by a masticatory mucosa whose connective tissue has adipose tissue anteriorly and minor mucous connective tissue covered by a pseudostratified of the hard palate adheres to the bony shelf in its core. The nasal side of the hard palate possesses a dense, irregular collagenous connective tissue covered by a pseudostratified its core. The nasal side of the hard palate possesses a dense, irregular collagenous connective tissue covered by a pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium with an abundance of goblet cells. The oral surface of the soft palate is covered by a lining mucosa. The connective tissue is rich in minor mucous salivary glands that are continuous with the glands of the hard palate. The core of the so palate is composed of skeletal muscles, some of which originate from the anterior edge of the bony shelf of the hard palate. The nasal aspect of the soft palate is identical to the nasal aspect of the hard palate. The soft palate ends in the conical uvula, which is covered by a lining mucosa on all of its surfaces with some minor mucous salivary glands interspersed among the connective tissue elements. The core of the uvula contains skeletal muscle fibers that function in elevating the uvula during swallowing. The jaw jerk reflexes, responsible for the opening of the mouth when one unexpectedly encounters a hard object while chewing one's food. This reflex is initiated when the sudden force encountered by the PDL causes the proprioceptive fibers to inhibit the muscles of mastication from continuing to contract, protecting the teeth from being fractured. Occlusal trauma, from atypical activities such as bruxing, grinding the teeth at night, or excessive clenching of the teeth may result in thrombosis or, in the worst case, ischemic necrosis of the PDL. Such lesions are responsible for the widening of the PDL space, i.e., the space between the cementum of the tooth and the bony alveolus, with a concomitant increase in the mobility of the tooth and, if untreated, the loss of that tooth. Alveolar damage may occur because of excessively rapid orthodontic forces placed on the tooth. The forces placed on the tooth become transferred to the PDL causing it to become inflamed, and in response osteoclasts are recruited to the PDL, where they resorb the alveolus to a greater extent than intended by the dental practitioner. The greater than anticipated widening of the PDL space may result in a possible loss of the tooth owing to irreversible motility. Holitosis, or bad breath, is usually caused by food particles that have not been removed from between the teeth from the crevices of the tongue, or from the pits of the palatine tonsils where this debris begins to decompose and emit an unpleasant odor. Additionally, individuals with poor oral hygiene or endodontics problems that have resulted in abscess formation usually have holitosis. The ingestion of certain foods, such as raw garlic or onion, gives the breath an unpleasant odor that disappears when the volatile oils present in these substances clears the bloodstream. Infections with certain bacteria, such as Haemophilus influenza, produce characteristic sweet, mousy odors that a physician well trained in microbiology should be able to recognize. Less frequently, organic problems may also impart a specific odor to the breath, the breath has an acetone odor in diabetes, smells like urine in kidney failure, and smells mousy in liver disease. Certain esophageal and gastric tumors can impart a foul odor to the breath as well. The tongue, Fig 16.5 and 16.6, is a large, exceptionally mobile, muscular organ that not only assists in mastication by positioning food on the occlusal plane but also functions in the formation and swallowing of the bolus. The tongue, also possesses four types of lingual papillae, most of which jut above the surface and have a masticatory mucosa whose highly keratinized stratified squamous epithelium allows the papillae to scrape food off a surface. Other lingual papillae are covered by a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium that houses taste buds to determine the taste of food. The muscles of the tongue are voluntary and divided into two categories, 
extrinsic muscles originate outside, but insert into, the tongue and move it. Intrinsic muscles are contained wholly within the tongue and alter its shape. The tongue has three surfaces, dorsal, ventral, and lateral. The dorsal surface is separated into an anterior two-thirds and a posterior one-third by the V-shaped sulcus terminalis, whose posteriorly positioned apex is marked by the pit-like foramen cecum. The posterior one-third is characterized by a lining mucosa whose surface is irregular because its subepithelial connective tissue is rich in lymph nodes, collectively termed the lingual tonsil. The root of the tongue attaches this muscular organ to the floor of the mouth and to the pharynx. Lingual papillae, three of the four types of lingual papillae are located on the dorsum of the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. The most numerous of these, the long, finger-like, highly keratinized filiform papillae, have no taste buds. They project above the surface of the tongue and function in scraping food off a surface. Fungiform papillae are much fewer in number, resemble a mushroom, project above the surface, and are dispersed in an apparent random fashion among the filiform papillae. Because fungiform papillae are covered by a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium, they appear as red dots on the surface of the tongue. The epithelium of their dorsal surface houses three or four taste buds. The twelve or so circumvallate papillae are located in front of the sulcus terminalis. They are depressed into the surface and are surrounded by a furrow whose epithelial lining possesses taste buds. The floor of this furrow accepts small ducts from the glands of von Ebner. The lateral surface of the posterior aspect of the anterior two-thirds of the tongue has longitudinally disposed groove-like regions, the foliate papillae, that resemble leaves of a book. The taste buds of these papillae degenerate by the third year of age. The depth of the furrows receives small ducts of the minor serous salivary glands of Ebner. Taste buds, taste buds, see Fig 16.5 and 16.6, are an intraepithelial collection of neural crest derived cells that form a barrel shaped structure whose opening, the taste pore, has microvilli known as taste hairs protruding from it. The taste bud is composed of approximately 60 to 80 spindle-shaped cells that are constantly being shed and replaced by new cells. The 3,000 or so taste buds function in the sensation of the five, or perhaps six, primary taste sensations, bitter, sweet, salty, sour, umami, delicious, and, for some people, fat. Each taste bud is completely intraepithelial and is composed of four types of cells, three of which have a lifespan of 10 days. The fourth cell type, the basal cell, type 4 cell, is a regenerative cell whose mitotic activity is responsible for generating new cells. The other three cell types are, type I cells, dark cell, type 2 cells, light cells, type III cell, intermediate cell, it is believed that basal cells give rise to type I cells that differentiate into type II cells that begin to degenerate and become type III cells and then die. Types I, II, and III all possess microvilli, taste hairs, structures that have the ability to respond to taste ants, chemicals present in food that become dissolved in saliva. Some of these taste ants activate ion channels, salt and sour, others activate C protein linked receptors umami, sweet, and bitter, and still others activate fatty acid transporters, lipids. Most of the taste that people associate with food depends on the odor of food rather than on the taste that is perceived by taste buds.